Ladies and gentlemen, speaking on real world solutions, Bitcoin and TBD offer merchants and consumers. I would like to, to please put your hands together as we bring up on stage for the next panel session, Angie Jones. Hello, hello. Thank you all so much. I want to welcome our panelists up. We have Mike Brock, who is the CEO of TBD. We also have Emily Chu, who is the co-founder and COO of TBD. And then we have Kay, who is the Bitcoin product lead for Cash App. And we have Chris Maurice, who is the CEO and co-founder of Yellow Card. Great panel before us today. Thank you all so much for being here. I want to hear in your diverse roles within the Bitcoin ecosystem, from your personal and professional opinions, what led you to recognize like the significance of Bitcoin and how do you use that to shape what you're doing in your careers right now? Well, the way that I recognize the significance of Bitcoin, I, I actually, I, a lot of people come to Bitcoin from a very, I want to say, political lens for very good reasons. And we've heard a lot of the important reasons for that. And in fact, the, the you know, the, the founder and leader of this event, you know, Farida is like a, a perfect example of the political reasons for Bitcoin. I talked a little bit about that at the, at the main event yesterday. But I actually came, I, I looked at it from like a purely like sort of, you know, secular technological lens in the very beginning. The sort of the reality that what technology is at the end of the day is a tool of the disintermediation of labor. And when I started to really think about it, when I was first introduced to Bitcoin in late 2016, which I... So I was pretty late um, relative to a lot of other people in the space. I came to, to, to realize that money and payments were bound to be disrupted, just like taxis and hotels with like Uber and Airbnb, because technology just wants to remove intermediaries. It wants to, to find ways to automate repetitive work. It wants to find ways to remove efficiency, uh, remove inefficiencies from the system. And so a technology like Bitcoin just sort of like just made a lot of sense when you thought about it just in the terms of like the, the long arc of technological progress. So that was that was how I kind of realized that that this was the shape of the future um, one way or the other. I, you know, as I, as I got to get deeper into it, you know, I, I formed a sort of a more holistic view, which I think unfurls its its way into what now makes our, our business strategy really focused on using Bitcoin for, in the near term anyways, for powering cross-border remittance um, as an amazing neutral internet native global asset. Um, you had a second part of that question? How, how, how have you used that experience to shape your current work? Well, you know, it, it, you know, I, 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 as I said, there's like a political side to the Bitcoin conversation, and when I and and one of the things I think Bitcoin has really allowed me to do is really reconnect to my, in in many ways, roots. I I I, I became a, a sort of a free speech activist when I was a teenager, and I was very politically engaged when I was very young, um, and I've always cared a lot about um, freedom and justice. Um, first in my country of my birth, Canada, um, and, in, and in my adopted country, the United States. And I've also, you know, as I got older and began to learn more about the rest of the world, realizing that, you know, I, I grew up in a very privileged society and realizing that so much of the world doesn't share in the gifts that, that I had growing up. And, and wanting to think about ways that, that I could give back to the world and um, spread the cause of human freedom and allow people to live dignified lives with, with governments that, that they consent to. So uh, Bitcoin kind of like, in many ways, kind of brought me back to that. And, and, and I've been able to really reconnect to that 
that cause and it's allowed me to meet a lot of human rights activists from around the world who are using this technology for very real things from you know, Alexei Nelvalny and, and Russia and his organization, I mean, they're, they're using Bitcoin for fundraising and, and paying activists on the ground to Farida again here with, with her, um, you know, for her activism um, to, to bring democracy to her home country of Togo. Uh, you know, these are, um, these are causes that I think are um, really amazing. And it's amazing to, to, to be able to take that first part of the story around that the efficiency that these technologies can sort of bring to business in, in a very sort of narrow economic sense can, can also uh, be uh, married to a real commitment for improving the human condition on this planet um, with things like freedom and, and, and human rights. So that, that I think is my answer to the second part of the question of how this has sort of changed and shaped me. Okay, thank you so much, Mike. Emily, how about you? Um, for me, Bitcoin resonates both as a technologist and also from a personal perspective. Um, as the daughter of immigrants and refugees of the Cultural Revolution, I think back to how when my mother and my grandmother left their country, um, my grandmother was carrying four children <laughs> under the age of five um, and trying to flee a country that was in the middle of a civil war. And you know, they took what they could, but that's a situation where the fiat currency isn't worth anything. You can't take your material possessions with you. They arrived in a new country and didn't even have the proper identity documents. And uh, I, I think about, you know, they carried what gold they could, literally, to a new world, but had they had a ledger, had they had a private key of their own to store their wealth, had they had the decentralized identity credentials that TBD is building um, in order to you know, not show up and actually have to find a passport that doesn't even represent their proper birthday. That's what my mom still has today. Um, these technologies are just very, very powerful for the kinds of human rights um, causes that Mike just discussed and that resonates from me from my personal history um, but it also resonates as we think about just the millions of people around the world today who are unbanked, um, who don't have the proper identity credentials to open a proper bank account. And um, you think about decentralized technologies where you don't need permission in order to participate in the economy. No one can deny you access because you don't have credit or because of censorship um, or because you don't have the right identity documents. This is really, really powerful technology that can increase access to financial services to the world. And when you look at the 1.7 billion people around the world that are unbanked, over 60% are also women, right? And so as a woman, I look and I say, there's 75 economies today where women actually might not be able to open a bank account without a signature from a guardian, or might not be able to hold assets which means they can't borrow and they can't start businesses, right? And having a hardware wallet in your pocket that gives you a bank account without permission, without a guardian that has to sign for you to be able to participate in the economy and have agency in your life, um, to send payments and to, to grow your business, um, that's really, really powerful and it can uplift individuals, it can uplift small businesses, it can uplift countries and an economy solving real problems for real people. Love it, love it. All right, Kay, how about you? How has uh, the significance of Bitcoin impacted your journey? Yeah, so for me, it's, it's similarly a mix of my personal and professional experience. And really what I mean by that is I'm a child of immigrants as well. My mom is from Malaysia, my dad's from Iran. And my parents met in London when my dad was running a business, an import-export business between Tehran, London, and the US. And then the Iranian revolution happened. And so he not only lost everything with his business, but his family living in Tehran also lost everything. It wasn't really until I was older and learned about my family history did I really start to understand the importance of why we might want to have a separation between state and money. And then as someone who's been working in the payments industry for almost a decade now, um, 
if there's one thing that I've learned about this industry, it's actually quite complex. And it's more often than not, uh, the system is designed to be more exclusive than inclusive by design. And so when I first started to learn about Bitcoin, its value propositions, the technology itself, um, it really resonated with me from the perspective of this is something that's actually from the get-go looking to bring more people into the financial ecosystem. And so I, I, it was pretty hard to unsee at that point how I could continue to be, to be working to advance you know, economic empowerment without focusing on a, on a tool like Bitcoin. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Chris, um, how, how'd you get into Bitcoin? How is this shaped what you're doing at Yellow Card? My sister, I'm a, I'm a very simple man. I, I love Bitcoin because Bitcoin actually works. If, if you are in, uh, you know, look, if you're in Ghana, if you're in um, a lot of countries around the world, how do you actually make international payments? How do you actually move money from point A to point B? How do you make sure that your money is going to be worth the same today as it is tomorrow? And the, the reality is, is that for, for most countries in the world, there are not good options. The access to dollar in a lot of countries around the world is very limited. The access to payments, the access to any sort of secure means of savings is extremely limited. And so, you know, Bitcoin and, and stable coins are the first technology that, that really democratize and enable people to be able to access that no matter where they are, no matter what they do, no matter what they look like, where they live, etc. And, and so I think, uh, you know, what, what's really drawn me into, into Bitcoin and, and, you know, really affirmed my love for the space is that if you need to be able to do something with your money, you can actually do that now. And, uh, you know, I think uh, with, uh, you know, with the, with the work that we've been doing, um, I mean, it's been, it's been pretty incredible being able to work with uh, companies and, and, and people all over the continent, right, that do very essential things and were struggling just to be able to keep the business operating before, right? I, I know uh, there's an example that, that Emily loves, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, if I didn't mention it, of a, uh, a pharmacy, a, a pharmaceutical company that we work with in Nigeria. They import drugs from India. Right now, some people consider medicine essential. I'm I'm not going to comment on uh, you know how the uh, how certain governments allocate dollars, but uh, this company is not able to access enough dollars to be able to import drugs to keep the country healthy. And so, how do you access dollars when your government doesn't allocate them to you, even for something essential like food, like medicine? How do you access those dollars? You need to find a better way. And, you know, even, even for the businesses and, and the countries that have sort of this limited access to dollar, it's still a much more efficient and much cheaper way, right? It's, it's so much better to use something like Bitcoin, to use something like stable coins than it is to go to the bank, fill out a bunch of forms, pray to God, and, and you know, hope that they actually allow that payment to go through. And so I, I think uh, I think you know when when people when people think about when people think about Bitcoin and 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 what it's actually doing, you know everything that that everybody here said is is very true and it is it's a very powerful technology. But at the end of the day, Bitcoin is great because it actually works. You can actually do whatever you need to do with your money if you have Bitcoin. Wonderful. Mike, for those who are just hearing of TBD for the first time today, can you give a brief description of what TBDEX is? Yeah, so, I mean, the, uh, how many people here are familiar with the SWIFT network? Yeah, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, most of you did, but for those of you who didn't, um, it's, it's essentially an international, you know, uh, messaging, payment advice system. Um, international payment system for facilitating um, the movement of money around the world. It's a, a, it's a closed system um, uh, that you, you know, that is fundamentally um, controlled through a, a very like, small amount of institutions. Um, most of the money that passes through SWIFT um, is cleared through banks in London or New York. Um, so very, very concentrated system. Our idea for TBDEX fundamentally is 
I, I guess the, the, the easy way to conceptualize it in your head is it's like an open SWIFT system that's able to take advantage of these digital assets like Bitcoin and stablecoin um, to facilitate um, transfer of money between um, individuals, businesses, and institutions, and governments, if, if, if they so choose. We think that would be great. Um, and, and maybe even beyond that, um, to facilitate trusted domestic payments that could ultimately disrupt um, you know, traditional ways that, that credit and debit are, tr credit and debit schemes um, throughout the world. Um, we think there's a lot of potential. It's made possible by the fact that we have this new technology, which Emily briefly uh, referred to, which is decentralized identity, sometimes called self-sovereign identity which is a technology that allows, without the need for any like centralized issuer, um, for communities, individuals, businesses, and, and governments um, to create credentialed identity that allows people to identify themselves to each other in a privacy-preserving, decentralized way. Um, so th this is not identity that can be surveilled. There's no central database that can be queried. Um, this is obviously always the, the worry of the cypherpunks when they hear things like, the, you know, like, like identity. Um, the great thing about it is it's, you know, a point-to-point -point technology. Um, you only, the only people who see your identity are the people who you disclose it to. This is, like, very important because people need to know who they're transacting with. They don't necessarily want third parties to know that they're transacting. They don't want surveillance on them. They don't want fraudsters or criminals, or in the case of, of um, malicious governments who may be trying to um, uh, you know, uh, prevent economic access to people in civil society who may be advocating for the rights of the rights of others um, to compromise them. And, 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 taking, and taking that technology and, and building an actual open payments network on it that we've called TBDEX um, allows us to build a fundamentally new global financial system, um, which I believe has great potential for business, for nations, and, and for, you know, as we've, I've referred to several times today, even human rights activists to be able to securely um, and confidently build verified payments around technologies like Bitcoin and, 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 light, like, and lightning on Bitcoin and, and stable coins. That's what it is. And we think it's a much, much needed technology that um, sits on top of foundational technologies like Bitcoin and stable coins and really allows us, to, I think, to start building the solutions which can take these things mainstream. That's what TBDEX is. Great. Um, how many people have heard of Yellow Card? Lots. Great. Uh, Chris, how many countries does uh, Yellow Card provide liquidity to? 20. 20 African countries. Okay. So we announced this week that Yellow Card is the first financial institution that is joining the TBDEX network. Chris, I want to know what this does, how does this enhance Yellow Card's offerings, specifically around accessibility and user experience for customers? Yes, well, I think uh, first I would say that it's, it's very impressive. TBD has only been live for one day and they're already in 20 countries. So that's, uh, <laughs> but um, I think, you know, in, 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 terms of, in terms of what it does, right, I think, uh, you know, like, uh, like, like Mike was getting at, the, the incredible thing about what TBDEX is building is a, you know, essentially universal language for payments, right? Like, you know, Mike alluded to, to Swift, and, uh, you know, Swift was great before the internet and, and you know, back when we needed it. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a new age, right? And, and so, uh, you know, what, what TBDEX has really built is this, this universal language that enables you to source liquidity, to, to talk to, uh, you know, PFIs, financial institutions around the world that have this liquidity and be able to actually facilitate those transactions seamlessly without having to integrate to each financial institution separately. 
And I can, I can tell you from personal experience, having integrated over 100 banks and, and mobile money providers across the, the continent, that integrating to financial institutions sucks. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really a revolutionary technology in that it completely streamlines and simplifies the ability to actually talk to these different institutions from anywhere in the world. And, and so, you know, look, I, I, I think it's very exciting that, that we're first because then anybody that's using TVDEX is, is going to be, you know, using our rails in Africa. But it, there's, there's so much more to it, right? And it goes so far beyond even just the continent, right? I mean, this is, this is a technology and a platform that will enable people access to liquidity across not just Africa, but the, the rest of the world, Europe, Asia, South America, wherever, wherever you need to be able to send money. And, and so I think for, you know, it, for businesses, I, I think that, you know, TBDEX is going to shape the way that people think about going international, right? Because the hardest thing about trying to cross borders, the hardest thing about trying to do business outside of your country is always payments. It's always, how, do I, how am I going to get paid? If I want to start selling stuff in Brazil, how am I going to actually get paid, right? How does, what, does that, what does that actually mean for me? And so I think that, I think that you know, now that we have a, I mean, you know, essentially a universal language for payments, uh, it's going to it's going to revolutionize and it's going to shape the way that businesses think about expansion across borders. Think about what they can do beyond just where they are, and think about really globalizing. Right? It's it's you know essentially what the internet did for communication. TBDEX is going to do for payments, and so I, I think that's that's very powerful. And uh, yeah, make sure uh, make sure you use Yellow Card via TBDEX. Thank you, Chris. Emily, reflecting on your journey from Cash App to TBD, what are some of the market gaps that you identified that weren't being met, and how does TBD's approach potentially address those? We had such an incredible journey with Cash App, helping to bank many, many people that were unbanked in the US, growing to 80 million people. And we took a lot of those lessons international because it's very, very hard to expand internationally. And what TBDEX does is provide an open source protocol that any wallet in the world, any liquidity provider in the world, any identity provider, any app in the world can sign up and use our SDKs and participate in this network to discover each other globally, to serve customers or off ramp and serve commerce and payments use cases internationally. And these are things that could take years for a company to do if they're trying to expand internationally in a custodial way, right? And um, it's so powerful. One of my favorite moments um, at TBD uh, is a little movie that we like to call Onboarding Ernest. Um, and they're laughing because uh, Ernest is a friend of ours who's based in Kenya. And um, he lives in the United States. And as many immigrants know, when you've made it to the US, you often have to pay the tax of sending money home to your family to support your family. Um, and Ernest was able to use our reference implementation wallet um, to move Bitcoin to his shillings account in M-Pesa um, and to do that in less than 40 seconds real time from Bitcoin to shillings without going through a bank, without going through an intermediary, just using TB decks with yellow cards off ramps at a fraction of the cost. Um, and that's just so, so powerful and exciting because when you look around the world, all these remittances providers that are traditional, um, Chris and us actually did a study where we had uh, his team run around sending money cross border and across the diaspora. And it's so extreme that in certain countries such as Malawi, um, you might pay 5, 10, 20% to send money, um, and it might fail. You might try four banks, right? And they might tell you, go home um, or return to sender or try again another day. Um, and with Bitcoin and with Stablecoin, they were able to not only send it real time, pretty much real time within minutes, but make a profit doing that, a 70% profit, because you're bringing liquidity into the country that needs it, and you're being paid the real rate of exchange for it, as opposed to the official exchange rate, right? 
And so it's a real, real unlock for people to use Bitcoin Rails and to use TBDEX as an open protocol, um, to use this for payments, um, for commerce, for sending money across the diaspora in ways that are not possible today because the payment system is so fragmented. There's no interoperability between different mo mo money accounts. Um, and this really does create a universal language and standard for any payments providers, any individuals, custodial wallets, self-custody wallets, um, to find liquidity, discover that on the network, connect, negotiate trust, and even be in compliance with credentials that facilitate KYC and AML if needed. And so we think that that's really powerful, the unlock here. Wonderful. All right, Mike. So you had a, a really significant um, contribution in integrating Bitcoin into Cash App. Tell me, what was the vision there? And has that evolved in any way over the years? Well, there wasn't really a vision in the beginning, believe it or not. Uh, it was... Uh, YOLO. Yeah, well, yeah, it was kind of YOLO. Um, it, in fact, it was Jack Dorsey coming to my desk the first week of January of 2017 and basically saying to me, well, we will, I, I, let me back up a second. We have this thing called Hack Week um, where every week, well, for one week at the company, everyone just works on a project that they want to work on. They can just assemble a team and, and, and they can try to build a new product feature. They can, they, they can try to do something like for the good of humanity. They can go clean up like garbage in the, the local park. Um, it's completely open. It doesn't have to be business related. But most people in practice on Hack Week will tend to work on product feature stuff. Jack walked up to me and he said, "We're going to do. A, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be on your Hack Week team, and we're going to do Bitcoin together." <laughs> and um, I actually told him no, uh, that I wasn't really interested in doing it. And it took him actually two days. So he, what he did was he camped out at my desk for a day and a half and wouldn't leave until I agreed to do Bitcoin with him. Um, so I actually started Hack Week uh, a day and a half late. So I only had a three and a half day <laughs> Hack Week to actually get a Bitcoin prototype into, the ca in, in, into Cash App, which we did not accomplish by Friday, but we did get it working the next Monday. We cheated. Um, and then after that, Jack asked me to like, actually turn it into a product. Um, and, and it took a while to figure out like what it was going to be. And, and you know, we, we just decided we were going to build a better on-ramp and off-ramp. Um, and we think we did that. It's a very successful product. Um, does over $10 billion worth of gross trade volume in the U.S. per year. So one of the largest Bitcoin on-ramps and off-ramps. Um, but yeah, there was really no vision in the beginning other than Jack just berating me into doing it. <laughs> and how has your, your views changed over the years? So you barely wanted to do it. Now you're at Africa Bitcoin, like on a panel. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> well, I mean, you got you heard what I said earlier. I mean, uh, I really, I really see the potential of this technology now. Um, like, it's without a foundational technology like Bitcoin, an idea like TBDEX would be a non-starter. So. I mean, it's all kind of come together for me, and I kind of see the, the opportunity for making the world a better place. Cool. And I, I, I see the time. I, I just want to like say like one last thought. Kind of wish I said this yesterday, but I'm going to say it here. Um, you know, I just been like thinking a lot. You know, the world is like really crazy these days. Um, war. Uh, you know, people talking about great power conflicts, um, different, you know, different blocks of power in the world. And it's certainly not lost on me that there's a lot of attempts to, for foreign powers to influence outcomes on this continent. And it just, you know, as I sit here and realize that I'm on, on Afri in Africa, and, and I realize this is the place where humanity was, was born. And I really think it needs to be the place that humanity has saved. This can't be, this can't be like another century of foreign powers 
trying to like steer the direction of the African continent. It has to be a century of Africans steering Africa for Africans. And then not only, and then and not even beyond that, not just Africans for Africans, but Africans for the world. Like actually being a place where of, of freedom and prosperity, because we need that. We need freedom and prosperity everywhere on this planet, especially on this continent. The, you know, this, this, is the, 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 this continent has the fastest growing population. Um, you know, uh, Nigeria is the fastest growing economy. Lagos will be the largest city, I believe, by 2050 in the world. There is so much opportunity on this continent to bring a lot of good to the world. And I really hope, and, and, and look, I mean, it, it's for all of you, I mean, here in Africa, you're responsible for your future. And, and, I, and I plead for you to take up the call you know, to fight, fight for this continent, like, like fight for freedom and democracy on this continent, because the world needs Africa. The world needs a free and prosperous Africa. I'm, 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 I'm happy that you have me here as your guest, and I want to come back as many times as I can, and I'm, and I'm super happy to do whatever I can um, to help in all of those regards. So thank you for having me and all of us here today. Thank you all so much um, for all of your thoughts. That was some food for thought, right? So we should probably go get some food for our bodies now. Um, thank you so much for having us. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so, so much.